Hey, <laughs> guys. Okay. Well, we finally reached erection day, so I'm wearing my uh, Ron Jeremy get up. Technically, this is my late grandmother's bathrobe. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to share some final thoughts. History. Politics. Politics, politics, politics. Uh, before you guys go out and choose which of the lesser two evils you're going to vote against. <laughs> so, we, we all knew it was coming to this. The, the Super Bowl of American politics. Hello, oh, Ivey. <laughs> you know. So, you're gonna go out there, right? And do the responsible thing and vote for Jill Stein. Aren't you? Because if you vote for one of them, you're gonna usher in an era of dictatorship. If you vote for the other one, we're gonna hit head first off the cliff. Of course, both of them head first off the cliff. But the good news is. It doesn't have to be that way. You can go out and you can vote for Jill Stein. Like me. Okay. I wanted to do something to explain the actual political system we have here in the United States and the role we play in it. These would be the role of the presidency. America is a republic. It likes to pretend it's a democracy, you know, LARP as a democracy, but republic and democracy are not even similar concepts. Republic is simply an oligarchy that LARPs at having elections. A democracy has its matters decided by the will of the people. An example being the democracy we see at Athens. Sure. A large segment of the population was excluded from participation, you know, for being women and for being slaves in Periokoi. But foreign visitors to Athens were amazed at how little slavishness the, the lower classes showed to my aristocratic baron when they were in Athens. And they were appalled, which is a good sign. The more aristocrats are appalled by your system, the more democratic you probably are. The aristocrats, of course, are very, very pleased with the American system and are fighting very hard to preserve it in the fashion that it's historically been, which is an oligarchy dominated by them. Unfortunately, that's proved less and less feasible because whether they like it or not, they still have the issue of what if a member of their class goes full Caesar and actually tries to convince the people that he's going to change something about the current system. <laughs> well, I think we're giving Trump a lot too much credit if we compare him to Caesar. But his position as a symptom of the corruption and the lack of actual accountability to the people that the institutions have here, this is the symptom of this problem. This isn't to say you should go out and vote for this pig, you know? He wants to set up himself as a petty dictator and have an oligarchy of pissants, ass lickers, you know, <laughs> those sort of schmucks. That, that's gonna be his oligarchy. The oligarchy we have now, which has a great many warts and has been responsible for, well, genocides, genocidal sanctions, overthrows of actually democratically elected leaders like Allende in Chile and Lumumba in Congo, actions that have had consequences that have led to the deaths of millions of people. And promoting a system that is fundamentally unequal and oppressive for the vast majority of the world. Well, that's the system you're going to vote for if you vote for Harris. 
So you have the current corrupt oligarchy, or a new, more corrupter, less competent oligarch. That's what you're voting for, essentially. It reminds me, in a large sense, of the transition between the Republic and the Principate. I don't want to say the fall of the Roman Republic, because in a large sense, it was nothing like a fall, rather a period of constant transition after struggles were unable to be resolved with any sense of fairness or decorum, let's say. <laughs> the Roman system was very successful for its time, it motivated people, but it was plagued by a dialectical class-based division from its very outset, that being the conflict between the patricians, the oldest families, the aristocratic families, and the plebeians, which means everyone else. And this isn't to say that the patricians were the only ones who were wealthy in the Roman state. There were wealthy plebeians called equites, who often were wealthier than the standard Roman citizens, or even some, you know, patricians. They would have immense wealth of their own, but because of their standing in society, not being a patrician, they were denied uh, a part to play in the power struggle. And this was something that they were, you know, fighting to get into, you know. So essentially three enfranchised classes. The patricians, who were undoubtedly on the top. The plebeians, the working class plebeians, let's say, who had a vote, they weren't slaves, they weren't, you know, but their vote wasn't worth very, very, very much, and they were sort of, through patronage systems, manipulated into voting in certain blocks, and also the way that Roman elections were set up, it would usually be determined well before it actually ever got to the poorest citizens in such a way that you know, the wealthier and more aristocratic you were, by far the more votes, more your vote mattered, even in the elections and the assemblies. And then there's this intermediate class, which is the wealthy plebeians, what you might call the bourgeoisie in a modern society. And this was a very revolutionary class as well. They were kind of like the hinge on which power turned in Rome, because they had the wealth to fund a patrician's campaign. But if they, their interests were representing, you know, their interests were closer aligned to the, the urban poor, even if they had economic interests in conflict with the urban poor, they could show solidarity with the urban poor. And a case of that was the strike of the plebeians. Rome was, sub was fighting a war, I think, with the allies. Socii, because of course, you know, they they have this Rome, which is enfranchised and contributes to the war effort, but they also have allies who are disenfranchised from the power system, not citizens, but were still expended, expected to bring the brunt of the soldiers, actually, for Rome, the inequality uh, between the Italian allies and the Roman city in general. I think this was a major dialectic as well in, in the Roman state that eventually got resolved with just all the, the allies getting citizenship. Gradually, pretty much everyone who was a free person in the empire got citizenship by the time of I think either Diocletian or Caracalla. I'm, I'm blanking on which, but that's, that's a different matter. The plebeians understood the city was in danger, and so they chose then to exercise their collective bargaining power and forced the patricians to agree to their demand of giving them representation through a tribune of the plebs. And the tribune of the plebs, the tribunate was in a sense a way to give institutional rights and powers to the lower class as a block. That this tribunate was something that could go to the people for a direct vote on many matters and in many cases had veto power over the Senate. Naturally, the uh, wealthiest senators 
were not too keen on this. Uh, they felt, you know, it was done under duress. You know, we don't want to give you any rights. You know, just, we, we give it to you under duress, so we want to erase it. And that's a big conflict. Many of the revolutionary, or rather, reform-minded politicians in the Roman Republic exercised their power through the tribunate to affect change in their system. Rome, of course, is an expansionist empire, especially in the Republic stage. A lot of people have the assumption that under the Principate, un when there was an unlimited power in the hands of the Emperor, that this was directed towards conquest. But really, it was more during the Republic that conquest was a more consistent part of the Roman state, because through the systems of magistracy in the Roman Senate, this almost always came with a military post. They were interconnected deeply, and you earned the prestige to move up the cursus honorum, the Roman sort of political ladder, through military victories most often. And this provided a strong motivation for ambitious Roman aristocrats to go conquer some other country and, of course, bring back the loot and use it to fund their political careers. Good example of that being uh, Crassus Pompey. Well, Crassus is more of a domestic guy, excuse me. Sulla, Sulla with his Mithridatic Wars. Uh, Marius. So then Marius were originally allies, but they fell on opposite sides of the divide that I will talk about later between the optimates, the aristocrats, and the populares, meaning like the populace, essentially, different parties. So the deal was they were expanding their territory and there was an immense amount of loot and one of the big forms of loot was human labor, slaves, taken from conquered territories such as Carthage. And there was like a glut, there was a massive, you know, influx of slaves. Meanwhile, the small rural farmers who formed the backbone of the Roman army would find their estates or their small, their small holdings unmanageable. In their absence, then their family members would often sell it to a large landlord, you know, just for the bread of their survival, who then worked it with the slaves from this conquest that was won through the labor of the people who were subsequently disenfranchised, the veterans. So they would come home and they had lost their land. They became an urban class with military experience and no one to be loyal to other than their general and hope that their general manages to secure them some land. So, and of course, this provided a strong motivation for certain generals to become heavily populist. The big divide was, of course, on land reform. Agricultural land was the basis of the Roman economy. As it was for most settled societies in, you know, human history until fairly recently. An urban population was always going to be an unstable kind of thing. And this was a voting base that would lead to the foundation of popul popularist movement with figures like the Gracchi brothers, Tiberius and Claudius Gracchi, who rallied the various disaffected soldiers from the different military campaigns of the Romans into a political movement that challenged the aristocracy. Now, these people, Gracchi, the Gracchi brothers, were dealt with with murder by the political aristocracy. But by entering into violence against these sacrosanct uh, tribunes of the plebs, who are, you know, they are protected by the gods through Roman law. There was no divide between divine law and civil law in Rome, of course. 
because that was the basis of law in antiquity. It's the gods, you know, provide for this law. Well, <laughs> once the Gracchi brothers are murdered, all bets are off. There's a lot of instability. And of course, aristocrats, being aristocrats, are very ambitious. They will find a way to ride any sort of political movement to come up on top. Because, you know, they're the cream. They have the name, they have the recognition. And we see figures like Marius and Caesar, Situs Caesar, who use this from the perspective of gaining a career in the Senate. And we also have more radical figures, more, more outwardly populist figures like Clodius. So Publius Clodius Pulcher is this uh, patrician, you know, a Roman aristocrat. And he literally pays a plebeian guy who's, you know, younger than him to adopt him as a son so he can become a plebeian. So he goes from Claudius to Clodius, a, a plebeian name, so he can become a tribune of the plebs. And because violence had become an accepted part of the Roman political system, which I will, you know, reiterate was something that was brought into there by the Roman aristocracy, we start seeing mob violence having more and more uh, influence on the political operations of the Roman state. A good example is Clodius and his vendetta against Cicero. They, they burned down Cicero's mansion in the Palatine Hill, his most prized uh, mansion. And he's like, oh, I'm finally successful. Oh, it's burning down. And then they did something really <laughs> neat, which is they, they put a, a, a shrine, a temple to liberty on the location where his mansion was so that he couldn't tear it down easily without offending the gods. <laughs> which is absolutely the most Roman thing imaginable. Of course, the conservatives, the uh, optimities, the best people, we are the best people, we are the optimates. Although actually kind of maybe Trump would fall in the popularities, I guess, I don't know. He's just a naked populist, but still serving the interests of the elite. Well, maybe it's not too different from the Romans, really. Cicero seemed to want to redistribute wealth. Octavius wanted to redistribute wealth, of course, but to himself. So, <laughs> and killed everyone who thought he was a dick. So now everyone loves him. Yeah. Skipping ahead a little bit with that. So, the deal with that was, well, uh, Cicero goes into exile, and of course there's conservative thugs going around, like Milo who Cicero was a big fan of. Because he wasn't really against violence in the political system, he was against violence being used by his political rivals. You know, Romans, they're all hypocrites. <laughs> That's the kind of the big thing about Romans. They're almost as bad as Americans. <laughs> but through this conflict, and the debasing of these institutions, and the rather than actually working, finding a solution to a material problem, which was absolutely solvable with land reform. Just give the veterans the land, give the urban proletariat more land in the countryside so that they can, you know, support themselves without being a, a required to have these patronage relationships with these revo supposedly revolutionary uh, bourgeois, polit bourgeois and aristocratic politicians. They said, no, we cannot. We cannot give anything. We can't give the, give the public land to the, to the poor or to the veterans. No, no that, that should belong to us. We should give it to ourselves because we're the best people. If we weren't the best people, why would the gods make us so wealthy? You know? <laughs> well, political struggle, violent street struggle, and a bunch of civil wars. Later, it ended up with a synthesis. The symbols, the, the operations of the Republic actually more or less stayed in place through the transition to the Principate. 
there was still a Senate. People still voted. There were still consuls. But what was changed was there was an all-powerful or unlimited power in the hands of an executive, the emperor. And over time, all pretense of the Senate being important in the national Roman politics was essentially eroded until it was finally limited by the period of the dominant, where Rome was essentially just a pure uh, dictatorship, a pure monarchy, actually, a more of a hereditary monarchy, which is what we see through to the Byzantine Empire, and these are the institutions that are passed on in the West, the barbarian kingdoms that eventually kind of dissipate or meld into what we think of as the predecessors to modern European nation-states, like the Franks going into France and Germany through their different predecessor sort of systems. This is a complicated thing. But there was never any point where they said, we're not a republic anymore, we're now an empire. No, they were still the Roman Republic, except now they had an emperor. I can see why people would think that's a contradiction in terms. Because in a sense it was. But the wealthy senatorial class that held most of the power in the Republic still held an insane amount of power in the Principate. But one of the effects of having a dictator, having a emperor, was that he could potentially represent the interests of the working class much better than through an unstable electoral system that was constantly rigged by the ruling class. Instead, you would find someone who came to power either through deposing the last guy, his daddy being it, which is actually very rare, being chosen by the last guy, which is actually more common, or just buying, like the Roman emperorship was bought a number of times. <laughs> that was a classic. Oh yeah, 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 the guards are just auctioning off the imperial purple. Just normal, just a normal thing, normal business as usual for the Romans. Not a total embarrassment. I guess the point of the matter is, the institutions that provide success for the expansion of a state, for the expansion of an economy, for the expansion of power, also plant the seeds for irreconcilable d divides in the body politic and for damage essentially to the same people who are, let's say the workers in bringing about this success. I'm kind of reminded of Animal Farm. <laughs> I, a lot of people think Orwell is essentially criticizing communism and socialism with his books. He isn't really, because it's really incidental, the fact that in 1984, <laughs> that they're calling it socialist, it couldn't be literally anything else. The ultra totalitarian state, which is really an oligarchy, not a monarchy, we should recognize that, that Big Brother doesn't actually exist in that world outside of a construct. Kind of like, <laughs> you know, that guy. <laughs> it's the inner party that governs things, and functionally, that's an aristocracy. And you can sell your aristocracy through the trappings and veneer of any ideology. Socialism was what Orwell chose to present his 1984 society with because he couldn't think of a better ideology than socialism. <laughs> if even the best ideology can be corrupted into the worst possible system and ideology, then he provides this as a warning against totalitarianism or the warning against an unlimited power in the state. A totalitarian system is not a totalitarian monarchy. 
Because a monarchy is functionally impossible. No one person can have that much power in a complicated system. At the very least, they delegate to people under them. But in the most power-hungry system, the oligarchy is the one who is truly in charge. <clears throat> and that's true across the board. We have an oligarchy in the United States that governs us that's challenged by a rising oligarchy. And you're going to choose which oligarchy do you like better. <laughs> you're not choosing whether you want democracy or oligarchy. You have no option for democracy within the current system. You can't have an option for democracy within the current system. It excludes democracy on its basic principles. It can make even if you know, it was possible within their system to achieve democracy from within the system. The system is designed to prevent people from actually wanting democracy. From understanding even what democracy is. That's why I propose if we are going to build something like a democracy, it cannot necessarily be accomplished from within the system or even by a revolution against the system. This is my, my little idea. So you who watch it to the end, this is the important part. The important part is right now. We are not going to build our democracy within the system or as a revolution against the system. We're gonna build our democracy independent of the current system. We're going to build something that all to all eyes ostensibly looks like something completely removed from a political structure from an authority from a system that people can recognize and say oh that's that's the official governing body of any area but rather something that's collective in these kind of systems representation in these sort of elected republics as to whether the needs of a class get met is usually based on block solidarity. Let me explain this further. In the, because in uh, different periods of time, different blocks could be counted on to vote as a group on this issue these issues are going to be addressed directly by the state, oftentimes by both parties. When we create a community, create a social structure that exists outside of the control or outside of the bounds of the state, but exerts influence on every member in this group, if we say every member in this group has to vote a certain way if they're participating in this election, that creates an immense amount of influence. Just a few thousand votes can have an immense influence if they are collected. And I think that's ultimately the only way you can resolve the, the problem of the uh, Zionist control in American politics. Because that's how they fought control in American politics in a large sense. They created a block that is consistent along the lines of this issue. They will not consider voting for a candidate if they do not support Israel. Build a bigger block. This is not really something so much for today's election. Today's 